Okay. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, normally, I hate to admit it, but uh, I get nervous before speaking in front of lots of people. And I'm not as nervous this time because I can't see you all. Uh, and I, I had to go to the bathroom every time I speak right before I needed to speak. Um, and I realized that this is a biological function that I had to do to excavate <laughs> everything so I could run away from everyone that I'm speaking to. So um, I just went to the bathroom and now I'm speaking to you. So, uh, and I'm really glad that there's another native Iowan, Matt Johnson here. Woohoo, Iowa. Okay. So um, I am going to tell you a little story about myself. Um, and maybe uh, I can get some hands raised, but who here has ever heard of public narrative? Uh, public narrative is the, the systematized way of organizing, uh, and I was trained in this, uh, in the labor movement. And so it, the first thing you do be, when you publicly speak uh, to people in a community is you tell your story, because they're like, why in the hell are you here? Why are you talking to me? So I'm going to tell you a little of my story. Is everyone ready for Paul's story. Yay. Okay. So first I'm going to share my screen. Uh, wow. There's options here. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to do that. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? We can see it. Oh, yes. Okay. So I come from a very special family. My dad was a radical priest and my mom was a nun. Okay. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. They got together, and uh, they were part of a radical uh, and progressive reform movement in the Catholic Church in the 60s and 70s, uh, loosely called the Vatican II or post-Vatican II movement in the Catholic Church, and they were what we call peace and justice Catholics, and we were raised – with a very radical conception of Christianity, that Jesus was a brown skin revolutionary and that we were trying to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. And what that meant is a society that included uh, all the disenfranchised voices, the marginalized voices into a community of great equality and love in which everyone has uh, all beings have a divine worth. This was our way in which we were raised. And there were lots of little things that we did that expressed those values. We lived very counterculturally. My grandma lived upstairs, and she was my nanny um, when I was growing up. Uh, these are This is me and my three brothers. I'm the middle one with the best outfit, uh, with the jacket. My mom dressed me. I cannot take credit for how cool I look. Um, but... Uh, some things were really challenging in my family. One is we didn't fit into the neighborhood because we were countercultural people, and my, my dad was sort of a social worker, didn't get paid very much, and my mom took care of us. So we didn't get paid uh, as much as sort of the middle-class neighborhood that we were in, and we got bullied a lot. And I am also dyslexic, uh, and I've had to really deal with a lot of shame around that because it took me a lot longer to learn how to read. Uh, and I was never traditionally a good student, which is kind of surprising now because I've written multiple books. But I still need a lot of support in editing and doing things because I spell really bad. And when I was little, this uh, difficulty was uh, I went to special education classes and kids called me stupid all the time. And it was very painful to make matters worse. My father died on Christmas Eve when I was nine years old. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, we did not expect that. And uh, lots of things changed in my family almost overnight. My mom had to get a low-wage job just to survive. Uh, she worked with elderly people. She was a nurse's aide at a nursing home, a very low-wage job, and treated like shit. And very stressed out all the time by the demands of the job. And we had a lot of time um, unsupervised where there was no one at the house um, because my, we were being raised by my single parent mom. And my brothers and I uh, 
there was a time where we didn't really talk about the grief of my father. My grandmother passed away very soon after, and my family was sort of falling apart in a lot of ways. But one thing that was just so special is that those values of taking care of each other in the beloved community and how we uh, we were we were taught that um, really was embodied between the brothers. And not just that, we started taking in misfits from the neighborhood. Uh, and they, uh, this was really a powerful concept. And my mom, I remember one, about three or four years after my father died, my mom brought us in um, to have a family meeting. And we used to have family meetings all the time with my, when my father was around, but we hadn't had one for years. And she, I thought she was going to announce uh, somebody had died, and she was just very stressed out, and, and she sat us down, and she said, you know, I realized today I had a hard time at work, and I realized that I can't do this alone. Um, I, I, I thought I could provide everything that your father and I dreamed of in the beloved community, but I realized that you all have to embody that. You all have to. Um, take this ideal because I can't do it alone. Um, I'm really struggling here. And I saw that vulnerability in my mother. It's so powerful. And she said something. She said, this is your kingdom. This house, I, I, mean, I will allow you to create your community in here. But, uh, and that's what I can do. But you have to really make it something. And we took that so seriously. So they say, Teenagers gravitate to the place of least parental supervision. That was my house. Everyone came to my house. Uh, we had a huge mix of people. Um, we had uh, the, the kid in the neighborhood who was really struggling with an alcoholic father that was in an abusive household. He came to our house. We had a, a, a Native American woman, Candy, who was a good friend of ours she, uh, that was really struggling with alcoholism in her family. She came to our house. We had uh, a guy who was a, a foreign exchange student from Argentina who was like, why in the hell did they send me, of all places, to Des Moines, Iowa? He came to our house, and we just, we all didn't really fit in. And at first, we had this sort of, um, uh, our political ideology was very what we call prefigurative. It was like we are going to uh, rebel against society. We grew our hair long. We didn't wear deodorant. Uh, we became uh, – all of us became radical environmentalists and vegetarians, and uh, we're like, screw all those people um, that had bullied us. But as time went on, uh, really what saved my life is that community, and I started learning – community organizing from my brother who was a hotel worker union organizer. My brother ended up becoming a union organizer and he was trained in this old school way of organizing where you develop leaders one-on-one -on -one, uh, and it has an incredible tradition. It has Saul Linsky, this is Marshall Gantz, Ella Baker, all these different organizations that know how to build organizations and do deep leadership development through generally one-on-one -on -one meetings or house meetings, and they build what we call a structure, and then they mobilize people through organizations. And when I learned this, this just rocked my world uh, because all of a sudden in high school, I had like this these powerful tools to organize all these social groups in my high school and um, – and to, to gain power. So we ran on a, a people power platform and, and student government at Roosevelt High School. I want to say I was the president uh, of Roosevelt High School my senior year, uh, power to the people. And uh, um, we, we started doing just lots and lots of different things to fight for student rights, to fight for sex education, to fight for um, not putting pesticides on the lawn, all these different things. But, and it really changed my life. It made me feel valued. It brought in all these people that uh, were, at first I felt were bullies, uh, really started becoming my friends. And my community, my beloved community, really expanded. And I became infatuated with the idea of becoming a community organizer and a student radical. And when I went to college, I went to college 
And I said, I'm going to organize everyone into, you know, one on one. I'm going to build this giant, powerful structure and uh, through this tradition and these tools and something happened. Um, it was called the battle in Seattle. Who here has ever heard of battle of Seattle? I can see you raise your hand. OK, this was the the. Uh, the giant protest to shut down the World Trade Organization because of their uh, practices to destroy the environment, cut in endangered species laws, uh, in and do horrible things against environment and workers in the name of free trade. And um, so the philosophy was surround the trade summit and shut the fucker down. That was the strategy at the time that we all understood. It did happen. The World Trade Organization uh, collapsed in negotiations um, temporarily, and uh, I became a summit hopper. I started uh, um, going from uh, trade summit to trade summit, getting arrested and planning giant protests. And it really rocked my world because this was not the type of organizing that I that I knew from the science of community organizing that I'd learned from my brother and the hotel and restaurant workers. I I started learning, wow, there's this way of organizing that's almost like concert promotion. And it has all these different types of leaders, uh, people like Lisa Fithian and Martin Luther King, James Lawson, Francis Fox Pibbin, George Lakey, and it has all these different organizations that that represent this different way of organizing. And this thing has it has a different theory of change, it has different tactics, it has different organization, it has different ways of looking at success. And each of those different traditions would a lot of times uh, critique each other. But the mass protest tradition was super good at doing mass scale actions. It was almost like concert promotion. It wasn't trying to build leadership. It was really trying to change the political weather by creating giant actions and grabbing the media spotlight. It was about organizing at high levels of momentum. Okay, so I was like, oh, I'm gonna learn this tradition. This is a new science that could take over the world. Uh, but 9-11 uh, happened and all of a sudden the protest movement fell apart. And I realized that uh, None of those traditions have all the answers. There needs to be an understanding of the deep science of organizing from different organizing traditions. That changed everything because when I did that, and instead of just critiquing one tradition or one type of organizing, starting to think about it, not as if I was in the tradition, I took myself a fish out of water. I took myself out of the water. Most people I talk to in organizing are like a fish in water. And this is a quote we often use from David Foster Wallace. There were two young fish swimming alone, along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods and says to them, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? We can't see the water we're swimming in a lot of times. Um, we just inherently and implicitly adopt the culture of the organizing traditions that we're coming from. So when I went to my brother who was working in the unions and I told him about all this amazing protest activity that we were doing around global justice, he that, oh, it's a flash in the pan. Oh, it sucks. It doesn't really work. It doesn't really develop leaders and whatever. But it did things that he could not do. It changed the political environment. Uh, it changed public opinion around free trade that's still having an influence on society till to this day. So let's take us out of the water. When I came out of the water, I was able to analyze all these different organizing traditions, all these different strategies and how they work together. And that's how you do intense strategy. Master level strategy is when you think about all the different strategies and how they can work together instead of just thinking one, instead of being dogmatically attached to one. So what I would like to do is give you 
an introduction to a master strategy course in movement, in movement strategy of a multiple strategic approach. Do people want that? I can see you. Do people want that? Raise your hand if you want it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see that. That's good. Let's go. Let's take a breath in. Take a breath out. Okay. I'm going to oh, give... let me jump in and just say, uh, as Paul is talking, feel free to throw questions into the chat and I'll sort of collate them and we'll have a couple breaks where I'll send some of those questions back to Paul. Okay. okay. So this is the inner, this is the master class. This is, this is the framework for you to be able to do multi strategic strategizing to take over the world. Okay. This is powerful stuff. Okay. So I want to take, a thousand, a, a, a thousand feet view, okay, of what we call a movement ecology. If you just look at any movement and you screen way out at all the different strategies and you try to see patterns, what do you see, okay? You see basically people fit into these basic categories, okay? Within these categories, we call these theories of change. It, within these they have a basic similar theory of change. Now within them, they have different organizing traditions. They have, you know, that, that have different lineages. They have different, different histories, different organizations have diversity within these buckets, but it generally fits within these five categories um, in what we call theories of change, uh, personal transformation, structure, mass protest, inside games and alternatives, okay? And what does a theory of change mean? A theory of change is everything else is based around a theory of change. A theory of change is when an organization starts, form follows function, okay? So people a lot of times think an organization is just doing this because that's what the organization does. But actually what happens when a founder comes and builds an organization, they build it around an idea of what they want to do. They want to do something. They want to change something. And that's how they build an organization, okay? It's not the other way around. Form follows function. So theory of change is the basic understanding of how people think about change so that they develop a strategy. So then they develop an organization. Then they develop tactics and campaigns and projects and whatnot. Okay. So the theory of change is that I believe that if we do blah, change will happen. So the first one in the category is personal transformation. And personal transformation is if I change myself or if I change one person or one my consciousness or the consciousness of one or a few people we can change the world okay like uh and that's how you change the world if i if i just my personal behavior my consumer habits my the way i dress or whether or not i meditate or whether or not i am a really good person or i'm anti-racist or i am um, um the best at at engaging in the most radical politics, that consciousness will create a model that will change everything, okay? So who here has experienced that basic philosophy, okay, with different people, okay? Now, let's just say you, you can write these out, and maybe you guys can help me throw, throw them out. But what are some things that fit in personal transformation? Okay, so you can start writing them and you can throw them out. The one is like yoga, right? Yoga is like, okay, meditation, a 12 step recovery a lot of times. It's like, we need, this is the way they're thinking about change. Meditation, a lot of times service providing. So, you know, a lot of times it's people who really care about the world. They're like, I can really only do, I can only help like do education to people who don't have education and need it so bad, uh, marginalized communities. I need to go there and provide services or provide things for them to change just one student at a time or one person or, or, or try to get food to the people that are hungry one person at a time, okay? Uh, education programs. Um, so if we heal ourselves and begin with our liberation, wellness, and enlightenment, we are able to create a change. So what are some other examples? Maybe what have come up in the chat? Well, uh, veganism and diet change has come up. Great. Great. What are some other ones? Yeah, different kind of religious practices. Yep, that's right. What else? Hey, keep them coming, folks. Tanya says hip thrusts and soy curls changed my life. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm not saying, I'm not judging any one of these strategies, okay? <laughs> like, there's some powerful stuff in, what do you call it? Hip curls? Yeah. Soy curls. <laughs> okay, soy curls. I, I don't know specific, that, that, that specific expression of personal transformation, but I know some of them are very, 12 step recovery has changed my life. I, therapy has changed my life. I'm a licensed therapist in California. I'm a MFT, a marriage and family therapist. I believe in this theory of change. It's very important and it's very important in our movements, right? Okay, next. What is the next one? Everyone ready for the next one? Okay, good. One thing I wanna say is theory of change. You can do the same tactics under different theories of change, but you're the you're doing it for different reasons. You're doing the same tactics, but you're doing it for different reasons. People are protesting or marching on the streets. They might be doing it, but they're doing it. They have a different strategy because they have a different understanding of how to create change. Okay, I just threw that in there, adding some complexity to it. Okay, so now let's go into alternatives. What is alternative? Alternative is. The IWW, the International Workers of the World, had a quote. They said, we must build the new world in the shell of the old, okay? It's like, we have to create the alternatives, and if we create the alternatives, we can change the whole world. Screw the world. We, this is what we have to focus on is the alternative. And if we do that, then we can build the new models, we can build the new world, and that will end up in the end having huge impact on people's lives. Uh, so like things like cooperative banks or cooperatives, uh, alternative medicine, and you can just write some of these down as I'm talking. What are examples of this? Organizations or examples of alternatives, alternative education, uh, cooperative business, even counterculture. See, some people are entering into counterculture and their philosophy is I'm just here to change me. But a lot of people go into counterculture and they're like, no, I want to build a new culture in the shell of the old. And that's the way I'm going to change society is I'm going to I'm going to create this counterculture. So a lot of people that are that are into counterculture actually are part of this theory of change, like punk rock or sometimes a, there's a whole political hip hop movement. There's a cultural renewal things, people who want to preserve an alternative culture in the midst of, of capitalist consumerism. Um, Okay, cultural institution organizations that create outside the status quo to serve the needs of the community, okay? These are, uh, so let's, let's, let's throw out some. What are some alternatives that we see? We got folks talking about uh, animal sanctuaries, so like- There you go. Uh, care directly for animals. Um, you know, also kind of producing, you know, small, small food producing operations, like people growing their own food or making kind of plant-based. Yeah. Yeah. Alternatives. Yep. Perfect. Um, gift Organic economy. About? Yeah. Great. What else? Throw it out. Throw out. Any others? Alternative medicine. Yep. Food not bombs is a big one. Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. Okay. Next. The next ones we're going to talk about structure, mass protest, inside game, all share something similar. Okay. And that they're actually trying to change the dominant institutions of society. Okay. Um, and in, in the left in the United States of America, most of our theory is based on the idea that we're all engaged in the dominant culture. We're all engaged in the dominant institutions, and therefore we have to think strategically about how, how do we change, actually change that, not create the alternative, but actually change and engage it, okay? And the first one that everyone understands the most is what we call the inside game, is using the rules of the game of either most of it is electoral politics but it's not just electoral politics because there's a bureaucratic game played if you're a teacher and you're trying to change the educational system from inside you're a principal that's also the inside game okay so it's it's like using the rules of the game to of the dominant institutions to try to win it um so the biggest thing is legislators lobbyists policy makers campaigners uh electoral campaigners Courts, so people, uh, lawyers are inside game. They're trying to work through the courts. Media, there's a whole thing of people going inside the dominant. This is not alternative media. Alternative media fits in alternative. These are people who are trying to work within the mainstream media. 
and get the right some stories out. Or sometimes they even work within Hollywood to get new messages out or whatnot. School principals, corporate boardrooms. Um, so they're working within the established rules and dominant institutions to reform them from the inside. Um, so who, what have we seen as the inside game in your movement? What do you see as the inside game? We got folks talking about a lot of uh, sort of like legal challenges. Um, yes, and they're, they're represented generally by organizations, right? There's like organizations that lead that that legal challenge, right? Mm -hmm. yep. What would you, what organization does that in your movement? We've got the Animal Legal Defense Fund is a big one. That's right. Okay, good. Do you have an electoral wing of your movement? Yeah, um, we've uh, like a lobbying wing, the Humane Society for the United States. Okay, great. So that's like the inside player. Yep. Um, Any others? We've got locally in the San Francisco Bay Area, we've got a group called Compassionate Bay that's doing kind of uh, lobbying around local legislation. Got fur bans passed in Berkeley and San Francisco. Great. Great. Good, good. So everyone get that? All right. We got two more. Two more left. Let's. Let's take a breath. Everyone take a breath with me. Everyone take a big breath in. And big breath in. I can see you. I can see if you're doing this. So let's do it over time. Breath in. Breath out. Next, structure-based organizing. So a lot of structure-based organizing in the United States of America is, there is, is based around commun a community organizing tradition Okay, uh, that comes out of Saul Linsky, that comes out of uh, the Civil Rights Movement with Ella Baker and, uh, and uh, the Mississippi, Mississippi Freedom um, Party, um, Mississippi Freedom Party uh, and uh, Freedom Summer. There, there's a whole tradition and lineage of this. You know, some of it comes out of communist organizing in the, in the 30s, uh, in the labor movement. Um, but this is, like I was saying, there's a whole there's a whole philosophy of how to do this. And there's many different traditions, but a lot of them center around that tradition. Uh, United uh, Farm Workers is one of the, uh, had a huge influence in the 60s at training lots of people to do this type of organizing. Marshall Gantz, who's at Harvard has institutionalized this. He created a whole curriculum that became really big during the Obama campaign in 2008, which is he labeled it public narrative as his as the way to talk about organizing it, but it uses this philosophy. Um, a lot of times you, labor unions who actually do organizing and mobilizing, uh, faith-based organizations called PICO, um, they used to be, now they're called Faith in Action, uh, but uh, People's Action is another one that's, that's kind of like that, which organizes lots of churches or community-based organizations um, to, to actually mobilize, to put pressure on, on politicians. Um, and what they, their philosophy is a little different. They're trying to build a base of leaders in an organization to pressure power holders or decision makers in dominant institutions to create change. So they're what we call the outside game. They're trying to build an outside power base to leverage it, we call it leverage, because they're trying to, like a laser beam, take this base of people to have influence on the inside. But they're not working on the inside. They're, tr they're trying to leverage the outside game to affect the inside game, okay? And that's what we call structure. So what is some structure-based organization that you guys have in your movement? Lewis says, I feel like this is largely missing from the... AR movement, but folks are whoa, talking whoa, about whoa, 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 that's a big realization there. Let's just take a breath around that one. <laughs> wow. That's a big strategic insight, okay? But do you have bases of people that are organized? Like, do you have a, a group that has thousands of activists doing grassroots activity to put pressure on? Do you have that? Yeah, we've got some names, definite, definite answers rolling in. Uh, DXE, the group hosting the call, as well as the Save Movement, um, Anonymous for the Voiceless, some, some groups doing that kind of activity. I think one thing that is challenging around this is a lot of um, activist groups and a lot of online groups, they, there's a challenge because they play the role of structure, but a lot of times they don't have much structure. 
okay? They don't have much leadership. They don't have real grassroots leaders and, and organizations that are really connected. So even though they play the role and they use a lot of tactics of structure-based organizing, like online groups, a lot of times they're not organizing to build those bases. And that's a lot of a missing piece within within a movement because movements on the long term need to grow bigger and bigger bases that can leverage power over the long term. And that's it, it's a real challenge in a lot of movements that they don't have enough structure-based organizing. Okay, so uh, it's interesting. And and I want to say, corporate campaigning generally fits in this category. Okay, that's the when I was I, I was just on for you know 20 minutes or something before this presentation, and there were some wonderful corporate campaigners, right? Really putting, they generally are trying to leverage the small base, but a lot of times campaigners are not actually trying to build the base. They're just trying to leverage whatever the base is out there, okay? And so they fit in this, but they're not necessarily doing base building. Does that make sense? And that's an important realization to realize in your ecology what is missing. Okay, so we have one more, and that's mass protest. This is my favorite one. Mass protest, okay? Mass protest is... How do you how do you grab the moment of the world when how do you create there's a trigger event, you know, that's creating all this momentum. There's all these people. How do you get them all to show up and, and grab the media spotlight and and do militant action like Black Lives Matter in, in the Sudanese Democratic protests or the protest uh, in Arab Spring? A lot of them were mass protest movements. Occupy Wall Street, Dakota Access Pipeline uh protests, um, climate strikes, like these are, they're different because they're not necessarily trying to directly go after a decision maker or leverage the base. What they're trying to do is actually change the political weather. They're trying to polarize an issue. They're trying to, to get, change the consciousness and the public opinion, creating large protests that shift public opinion, okay? And you can measure this. Mass protests really do this. I mean, we have a lot of statistics and a lot of, of, of things that you can see around civil rights throughout uh, the changes of, of, of public opinion around civil rights through a 100-year period. And what you'll see is the most dramatic changes happen around mass protest activity. Same thing around gun control. Same thing around any issue you're talking about. Mass protest movements are generally the ones that change dramatically the public opinion around the issue and that changes the environment for everyone it changes the weather for the entire movement it makes structure-based organizations more effective because now they have a whole they have a bigger base of people that are interested in bringing into a solid and structured base okay so what are some mass protest organizations in your in your environment in your yeah i think folks are doing a good job naming that um, a lot of the organizations we listed before under structure, so direct action everywhere, the save movement, um, folks are also adding in hopefully animal rebellion uh, and Rose's Law campaign group um, are, you know, sort of have a leg in both of these, okay. but haven't seen, you know, yeah, have seen kind of some success, but are, are kind of straddling these two. Points. Yes, yes, good, good. Good. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. How do how do different theories of change work together or not, and whether or not to, can an organization hold multiple theories of change? We're going to talk about that. So, so just take a breath. Let's take a breath. I'm, I'm looking at everybody. I I need a better breath than that. Let's do it. Can I get sparkly fingers? Can I get some sparkly fingers just to feel some affirmation that people are out there, they're actually listening, they're not going to the bathroom, they're not checking their email. Okay, so personal transformation, how does this work? So, you know, if you're like a teacher and you, this is a lot of times, uh, and old Marxists, talk about this is the process of articulation. Say it with me, process of articulation, okay? This is like what you might call conscious raising. How do you, how do people build their consciousness, okay? And this was postulated by this Italian Marxist theorist called Gramsci. He said, this is generally how 
people develop their consciousness. They generally start with personal transformation. That's how they think about change is because they, it's easiest to understand. They can understand affecting themselves or just the people around them. And then they generally move to alternatives. They maybe build, oh, I want to build something different. It might be in a little small place. Not everyone goes through this transformation, but if you're a teacher, you, you go and, and you do, you're in your class, you're trying to affect it one student at a time, and then you realize, wow, this system sucks. Maybe I can try to, to do a different model of a class or get some teachers together to just do some experiments that might be better, right? Might be a better system or you might – and you might even get really good at that and do like a charter school. But then you start realizing, oh, crap. This is not enough. Like the alternative is not – we don't have enough people. I never can scale this. It's very challenging. And a lot of times you say, okay, I need to start – influencing the principal and the school board and getting more funding and I have to change education policy and you start going to the inside game, right, electorally. Who, who's experienced somebody that's gone through this process so far, right? They say, okay, now I have to vote and I have to get involved in the Democratic Party and I need to get involved in, in this and that and I have to lobby the principal, okay? And then they start realizing, wow, I – the politicians, they don't fuck – care what I say, <laughs> they don't want to listen to me, and you say, okay, I got to have more people on my side, I got to get my friends involved, and I have to get a union, I have to get the teacher's union, or I have to get parents together, and we got to talk to the principal, and we got to put pressure on the principal, and they can give us what we want, and then you finally realize, wow, even it's really hard to get a lot of people together, and our union isn't powerful enough. We really have to build a movement. We have to think about this in a much bigger way, and we have to change Americans' opinions about public education. And then you start talking about mass protest movement, and you do teacher strikes. You get the structure-based organizations start doing things to change public opinion around a ma to create a mass protest movement around public education. Right? The teacher strike was a good example of that. A lot of teacher strikes were not really led necessarily just by the unions, but by this sort of groundswell of activity to change public opinion, and it did. It dramatically changed public opinion all over the country around public education. Okay, so that is the natural process of articulation. It doesn't always happen that way, but it does. You know, there, there's a lot of it. Now, I have a question for you: Which theory of change is better? Which theory of change is the right one? What are people saying? Everyone's caught on, Paul. They, they know it's a trick question. Oh, it's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to shame some people right across the, the internet. I wanted to say, no! Yeah. But I want to say this. It's really funny, and obviously it seems very simplistic, right? Because I'm, I'm really – this whole presentation is like talking about how not one of them works. But – if you go out and we – you start working within a coalition, I do trainings for hundreds and hundreds of different activists, and I ask, who here has worked in a coalition? And everyone raises their hand. Who here has had a positive experience about working in a coalition? No hands are raised. <laughs> like maybe one person, and they're kind of reluctant. They're like, uh, I don't – you know, maybe I should raise my hand because other people in the coalition are here. You know, Maybe I should raise my hand. You know, people have a horrible experience, and why do they have a horrible experience? Because a lot of times coalitions are trying to bring lots of people, sometimes in structure, but good coalitions are trying to bring a lot of different – with different theories of change, and they all crap on each other all the time. They're just, they're just pooping on each other all the time. I mean it's like your theory of change sucks. You're, you're this. You're that. Okay, So our basic theory is that – and we've studied this time and time again – is that – Really effective movements have what we – a good ecology, right? And what is ecology? It's not market. It's not exchange. It's a, it's a synergy of relationships that makes the whole system flourish, okay, in diversity. And there is an interdependency, a real interdependency. And it's not that it is easy. This is not easy. But this – like the, some of the biggest tensions in the civil rights movement was between the black church – the mass protest organizations, the, the structure organizations, which were like uh, the Black uh, Porters Union, um, the, the Sleeping Car Porters Union, which was a very prominent black union at the time, 
the inside game of the Democratic Party, all these things had tons of tensions. But when it was really working, they the black church was backing up the mass protests. The structure-based organizations, which w- were the alternative, the black church had this huge, massive alternative. Even though they were very skeptical of mass protests, when it was working, they would support it. And the first major protests in the civil rights movement were led by these black churches that formed a whole alternative public transit system as a way of boycotting the public transit system in Montgomery. And if they didn't have the interplay between a mass protest structure and alternative, that would have never worked, okay? So a lot of times we're in our silos and we're doing campaigns and tactics that are just in our silos, but it's really interdependency that makes really effective strategy. And it's very complex how that interdependency happens. But the first thing you have to do to be a massive and awesome strategist, you want this. You have to acknowledge that there's consequences for your actions. And there's tons of consequences. And it's natural because each organization and culture within the organization is built on a different theory of change. So they're not necessarily good at doing everything. They're good at doing what they do, and they're not good at doing what they not what they can't do. So what all first acknowledge there is tons of conflict. We just have to on, be honest about that and understand the need for interdependence. So what are some of the things that we say against different theories of change? What are ways in which we crap on different theories of change? Okay, I want you guys to throw this out. What are ways in which we we crap on different theories of change? What does structure and mass protest inside games say about alternatives and personal transformation? Well, uh, a one that we hear a lot um, for that some folks have thrown in the chat, folks in the mass protest space hear a lot is like, oh, you make vegans look bad. Yes. Good, good. Uh, People calling each other too radical or not radical enough. Yes, good. Let's see. Calling each other filthy capitalists. Yeah. Right, that's right. (laughs) Well, so that's like alternatives critiquing mass protests or inside game. Oh, you guys are sellouts. Oh, you guys are assholes. You guys are hypocrites. You know, you're... You're still wearing leather shoes to your meetings, right? You guys have that one? Does that ever happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every okay. Protest. Like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're not embodying those values. You know, you're a hypocrite. You, you know, you're you you're using the tools of the masters, right? You become that which you have hate. You hate, right? Isn't that what alternatives and personal transformation say to those guys? What does mass protest inside game structure state of personal transformation alternatives? Nasal gazers, you're elitist, not you're not popular, you're not you know, you no one's gonna listen to you, you're not trying to actually make change. Go off in your little hippie land, right? Do your little thing. Folks are throwing people we'll call them cupcake vegans into the chat. Yes. I'm not saying any of these things are right. I'm just trying to air it, air it out, okay? I'm not saying this. I'm just saying this is what other people say, okay? I had a long period where I did not wear deodorant, okay? I, I, and, and I think, I really think in the post-revolutionary society we should not have deodorant. I, I think, I do believe that. But right now, depending on what role I play, there's different cultures. I sometimes, you know, I could even wear deodorant. You know what I mean? So, anyways, the point is, uh, what we experience is this form of dogmatism or purity culture that really hampers the ability for to have multi strategy. Okay, and what that means is you have this idea that there's my strategy is the only one that works and it's the only one that's important. And you don't acknowledge the strengths and the values of other types of strategy and the other cultures of other types of strategy. That is the big thing. That's the category. If we, if we just talked a lot of crap, a lot of that would fit into this category of dogmatism and purity culture. Another thing would be what we call individualism. Individualism or self-sufficiency within a theory of change, which is the, this. you think if everyone would just be a vegetarian, this would all be okay. That's all we need. We just have to focus on this one strategy. Everyone must be a vegetarian. 
if everyone would be a vegan, if everyone would, would just do mass protests and everyone was out on the street, then we wouldn't need all that other stuff, okay? That is what we call individualism or self-sufficiency, and it's just not accurate. That's not how movements really win, is using one theory, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so we believe in a movement ecology in which all those theories work together, and what we have to acknowledge is people are going to play different roles based on the organizational culture that they are living with. And that organizational culture that we're talking about is we have this quote. This is, this is a big quote. I'm going to drop this quote so everyone needs to be ready for it, and therefore we need a breath. Okay, everyone take a breath in. Okay. The quote is this. You ready? Open up your ears. I want to hear it. I want to see the ears open. Okay. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. That is by one of the most famous organizational consultants in the corporate world, and he is totally right, which means that the culture of your organization and your theory of change that you inhibit in your life and you embody generally controls your thinking. It controls how you think and strategize. And so it's very hard to yank your, to, to take the fish out of the water so that they can think multi-strategically. It's very challenging to do that. You have to acknowledge that if you're working with somebody in a union, they have to work within their culture. It's very hard for them not to. They can do things for you, but there's limits to what they can do because they're functioning within a culture, within a theory of change. Okay? They can do some things, but there are a lot of things you, they can't do. And so what, what complex collaboration and strategy is thinking about how we can work together and each person can hold their role in a way that contributes to an entire movement ecology that can take over the world. Okay, this, That is the highest level of strategy, and it takes a lot of work to think through that. Okay, And we can get into a lot of examples here. Okay. Um, so I'll just end with this example. There's two examples I'd like to give. One of the most innovative thinkers in movement ecology was Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian independence movement. It wasn't just him. It was a whole variety of leaders in the Indian independence movement because their society is very, very spiritual uh, compared to a lot of other uh, – a lot of uh, other – colonialized cultures that has a high level of, of uh, spirituality. I guess all uh, – most cultures do before uh, colonialization. But um, they had a real understanding of this movement ecology. So in the Indian independence movement, if you study anti-colonial struggles, the level of mobilization is unbelievable. I mean they had – Hundreds of thousands of people go to jail for months on at a time. They had Satnagraha campaigns that shut down a government with millions of bureaucrats in it, hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats, and 25 percent, 250,000 people resigned their positions in the government. Okay, the, the level of general strikes that they pulled off, where everyone would stop working when the movement said stop working, is unbelievable. Okay. And you ask, how did they do this? How did they mobilize? And we have an article about this uh, called um, uh, Indian the Gandhi's Strategy for Success Have Multiple Strategies. And you, we wrote it for Waging Nonviolence. You can look at this. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting is not – the reason why it was so, so amazing is because this struggle went on for 60 years of – really deeply maintained struggle of the Indian independence movement. And it went through multiple cycles of high levels of mass protest activity. And they called mass protest activity Satnagraha, okay? Which is like their the wing of the movement that did mass protest. And they had a they had an alternative political party, the Indian uh, the the Indian National Congress, which was the largest grassroots organization uh, in the country and the largest political alternative political structure. And they had what they called a constructive program, okay? So everyone uh, – they had this idea that everyone 
was going to create alternative ways of doing development that that was what the the biggest symbol was a spinning wheel they got hundreds of thousands of people to spin their own cloth and a whole alternative economy of how to uh, trade and exchange um, cloth uh, so that the, everyone had cloth and that homespun cloth became the uniform of the movement and the spinning wheel is still on the Indian national flag it's in the middle of the Indian national flag because it became such a symbol of the Indian independence movement. So when the movement exploded and it did all these major things and it changed public opinion and it mobilized people, the movement died down and then it was absorbed into the political party. People were – their consciousness was raised and they were absorbed into political parties and they were absorbed into alternatives, which were ashrams and communities. And, and in these ashrams and these communities and, and, and these spinning collectives and cooperatives, they were radicalized politically so that they could be mobilized for the net. In, in another six years, there was a mass protest movement and they would be absorbed, and then each of the movements – would interrelate. I was doing research on this, and I was studying uh, this really boring stuff in libraries that no one studies other than scholars. And I was looking at the the documents, um, the financial documents of the the All Indian Spinners Collective that had a quarter of a million people in it that were living off of spinning, and it said. Uh, for three years, they had no records, and I was totally fascinated by this. And finally, I looked in the, in the little footnotes, and it said, for three years, we do not have uh, records because all of the accountants are in jail during the Satnagraha campaign after the Salt March. Okay, And I was like, whoa, what if <laughs> this 250,000-person organization cooperative was all mobilized into mass protests when the time was right? What if – all the weavers and the organic food people were mobilized into a mass protest movement around around alternative uh, food. I mean, that would be amazing. But the interconnectedness of it, the interdependency and the collaboration between those strategies have not been developed. Okay, So Gandhi always emphasized what he called the constructive program. So he had the mass protest wing, he had the political wing, and he had the alternative. And he always said we need to work on building the alternative. And, and leveraging the alternative so that it can mobilize to change the dominant institution. And that's one of the reasons why that movement was so powerful. We see many examples of that in socialist movements at the turn of the century that were incredibly effective, that created cooperatives and that mobilized people and did incredible training of leaders and personal conscious raising and education and created huge alternative educational institutions. We see that with the MST still to this day, the landless peasant movement in Brazil incredible movement ecology and still one of the most prominent big uh, movements that that combine both a union structure an alternative uh, agricultural structure a mass protest movement uh, and and a political wing all together okay good okay so uh, I think we could do a breath. One more breath. And let's do some questions. All right, great. Um, so we'll take, I've got about four questions harvested from the chat already. We'll see if any more come in, um, but I'll probably only spend time for two or three right now, and then we'll do a little music intermission. And get to Sounds wonderful. Stretch your legs and go to the bathroom again. Um, so. A uh, question from Chris is, where do clandestine direct actions fit into this? So like underground, things like the Animal Liberation Front, Earth Liberation Front, do, do you see those as fitting into one part of the ecology? It's a very hard question. This is a very hard question. Good question. Good question. There are certain tactics where do, like, the underground that illegal breaking and entering um, type of organizations and actions fit into all of this? Have detrimental effects to the whole ecology. Uh, they're sort of toxic ecologically. Um, and we write about this in our research. Uh, this has been written about a lot in civil resistance, is that violence, and, and I'm going to get into what violence is, is uh, violence. And I'm not necessarily talking about property destruction, just 
just the concept of what what people think is violence. I'm not I don't I what I perceive as violence is different than what the public perceives as violent. Does something because the, the pe people see generally the movement as as a as as somewhat of a unified concept. The public does. And so it has really detrimental effects on popular participation of people participating in the whole ecology. It affects, for instance, people who want to want to get people involved um, in the Indian independence movement. When violence broke out, it was a lot harder to get them involved in the politics. It was a lot harder to get them involved in the unions that were involved in. It was a lot harder to get because people are scared of that. Now, polarization and people are always not going to like the tactics, but there's certain tactics violence like physical harm to another human being I, i'm not saying that's the right or wrong definition i just think that's the definition that the public perceives really does create a negative uh impact on participation and active when we do lots and lots of research about movement ecology active popular support and i'll say that again active popular support is the cornerstone of what makes a movement work that is the lifeblood of all every single piece of the ecology need more and more people to get involved and to and to put their resource their time and volunteer okay now is property destruction and and doing clandestine stuff does it have a positive or negative effect on the whole ecology i believe it does okay that from my study and my research it might not be popular but i think it has a negative on the whole ecology and the reason why is because the government uh a lot of agent provocateurs we know this from a lot of research that there is agent provocateurs and the the right wing that is very intelligent wants a lot of that activity to happen so that they can use it as a justification to repress uh the whole movement and everyone is affected by the action of that and also it, it they can use it as a public relations a campaign and this isn't just on the left it's also on the right when the right bombs um or, or does property destruction against uh, abortion clinics there's a huge positive polarization that happens towards um towards the uh, pro-choice movement okay uh, uh, because the public is so averse to that tactic most tactics you could be very very militant non-violently and the public might not like the tactic but if you do the polling most of the time you might not win them on the tactic but you'll win them on the issue but once you start going over into property destruction uh hardcore property destruction and violence you actually lose people on the issue too that that to me it's not about morality about what's right and wrong it's about what is strategic and whether or not it actually creates active popular support and whether or not it you actually win more power for your entire movement and you're able to win the case okay that's my opinion uh i know some people probably are not happy about that all right thanks paul um that's uh a, a, that was a thorough answer, and so it took the time that I wanted to spend on questions for this break. So we'll have another question break um, after the second part of Paul's presentation. And in the meantime, we're going to take a little musical intermission. So we're going to hear a performance by Eva Hamer now. Maybe we can get Paul to stop sharing the screen. Oh, yeah, Paul. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, this is a song called Have You Been to Jail for Justice? And it's written by Anne Feeney. Have you been to jail for justice? Run it, Caesar Chavez, or roast the hogs that day. From the story that I
right, thanks so much, Eva. And uh, we'll get right back into it, Paul, whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay. Let's take a breath. Wow, that, that screen, that moon mandala. We really have to change that one. That's uh, not so good. Okay, anyways, let's take a breath in. Breath out. Everyone listen to me. Can I get some sparkly fingers? I'm watching everybody. Okay, I see. See? You have to interrupt your checking your email. You have to interrupt it. To listen to me. 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 Okay, got it? Uh Trigger events. What are trigger events? Okay. One of the things that can give you magical powers, okay, just if you understand them, you can change the world. You can do lots and lots of things, okay, if you can understand the power of trigger events. Because what happens during a trigger event is everything changes very, very quickly. Everything changes. And if you know how to change with that trigger event, you know how to use trigger events, um, you can have a big impact on the world. Okay, And a lot of that has to do with just being prepared and understanding what it means. Like if you're even if you're on the stock market, if you know about trigger events and how they happen and you're prepared for them, you can make millions of dollars on the stock market. I'm not I, – I don't think you should make millions of dollars on the stock market, but I'm saying that's a metaphor for movements and trigger events. Okay, and What are trigger events? <laughs> trigger events are these, these big things that happen that change public opinion and create a media spotlight on an issue, okay, and – it happens um, very quickly, and because of that, public opinion changes, different issues are elevated, lots of things, and we've had a lot of trigger events in our time. 9-11 was a trigger event, and it changed politics for, for eight years, were really dominated by the, the impact of 9-11, uh, the terrorist attacks at the Twin Towers, the Iraq War, uh, the um, Katrina, right, that totally changed public opinion around the Republican Party and around George uh, – around um, uh, Bush, the president at the time, and also the collapse of the economy. Those were huge trigger events, and the movements that were able to capitalize on those, or, or rather they were able to respond in, in, in a correct way, a compassionate way, in a way that was able to mobilize people and use those things, had huge impacts on society, while the opposition, if they knew how to use them – and uh, there's lots of people that uh, that tried to do that that destroyed the world by using those trigger events. And right now, the coronavirus pandemic is by far the biggest trigger event I've ever experienced in my lifetime. It's horrible. I mean, it, it's just I don't think we. It's hard for me because I'm I'm sheltered in this little bubble of my intentional community. And Rebecca Solnit's this, this great author. She said we need a we need a word that says. I am okay personally right now in my home or just in my personal life. I'm sheltered, but I am I'm experiencing moral distress at the state of the world. Okay. And occasionally that bubble breaks because I realize like I have a cut I have multiple cousins who live in rural Wisconsin who don't have jobs anymore. Or I have a I have an uncle that is supporting a whole family, doesn't have a job anymore. I I have workers who are work in the hotel and restaurant industry where my brother was uh, – where I was an organizer, and my brother is still an organizer, and 98 uh, percent of them were laid off overnight in those communities, those impoverished communities where a lot of those workers were living in, Inglewood and Lenox and Los Angeles, are, are – it's, it's horrific. I mean the effects of the whole community is horrific, and that's not including just the health crisis. I mean we're talking tens of thousands of people dying, and – and if any estimates, most estimates are that on the on the global level, we're going to have millions of people die um, by the end of this this catastrophe, this pandemic. And so this is a big trigger event, and we have to really orient to what does that mean. And this is what I want to say: when I was studying the science of organizing, 
And I was really getting into the science and it gave me so much power to build organization. I knew how to build leaders and do these almost, almost these like incredible science of how to build organization through building leadership and developing people's conscious and having meetings and putting pressure on decision makers. This science broke apart after the World Trade Organization. All of a sudden there was a spotlight on free trade and globalization and the negative impacts of that when Teamsters and Turtles, you know, people dressed up in turtle outfits and Teamsters Union, they were marching in the street, shutting down the World Trade Organization. All of a sudden, everything changed. I had a meeting about three weeks after, after that protest in the basement of a church, and I was expecting through my science of organizing that about, you know, maybe 10, 20 people were going to show up, and 200 people show up, and I have no idea where they're coming from. They're being mobilized all over the place. <laughs> They're being mobilized through this trigger event, through outside of any structure. They're dramatically changed. People who have been, their consciousness has been raised, not through one-on-one -on -one relationships, not through just being in the community, but through this moment, this trigger event. This is what uh, happened during the civil rights movement and, and when Saul Linsky, who is the father of community organizing, and, and his, one of his disciples, Von Hoffman, um, they were organizing in Chicago, and during the Civil Rights Movement, they experienced this huge explosion of activity in which um, thousands of people started showing up and making huge sacrifices without any – and their science was thrown out the door. And they didn't know how to deal with it. And they said, you know, maybe I should think I should toss out everything we are doing organizationally and work on the premise that we're in a moment of the world now. We are no longer organizing but guiding a movement. There's massive amounts of people out there that are activated, not through the traditional channels, and we have to figure out how we guide that. We have to create new channels. We have to do different things, okay? What does that mean? There is a new emerging ecology that's happening around this pandemic. And we're all part of it. Everyone's part of it, okay? Because we're all deeply affected by the pandemic. We're all being deeply affected. That's not the same in, in every issue, okay? This issue strikes at everybody, okay? The zombies have come. They are here, okay? Everyone's <laughs> affected by the zombie apocalypse, and the apocalypse is here, okay? Maybe not the end apocalypse, but, you know, the pandemic is pretty big. And that means... We have to start thinking in a different way about how we respond to this crisis. And the two major things we have to think about is how do we reorient around this emerging movement ecology, around mutual aid, meaning there's a huge and massive need. We need to figure out how everyone in different issues and different organizations can come together and meet our needs collectively because there's so many needs that can't be met by, by the government, by the healthcare system, by the market, by people just buying things because people don't have money anymore. So we need to think, and we're all doing that naturally. Everyone is doing mutual aid within their families and within their, among their friends to try to get their needs met. But there's a, we need to be thinking about that. How do we do mutual aid at a bigger level and how we do that as a movement? And the second thing, and that tr this trigger event is specifically, a lot of trigger events you don't need mutual aid. This one you really do. And we also need advocacy. We need to have a movement around advocacy that's related to the pandemic, okay? And those are the two wings of, of, we believe, the emerging ecology. And we already see that happening. We see mutual aid networks coming up. We see a lot of people making face masks. We see a lot of different people thinking about how to meet needs at a larger and larger scale. And we see all these different organizations like unions doing mutual aid for their members. And so we have this mutual aid thing, and we have this advocacy thing. And guess what the conclusion is? They need each other. These two pieces need each other. The advocacy wing, there's all these new groups that are now – every single single issue group is reorienting around advocacy and figuring out how does this pandemic affect our issue and how do we create a common agenda around the advocacy. Okay, so – and the reason why – the trigger events have a huge impact, and we need to respond this way, is because during a normal time, there isn't as many people that are in need of help or who are agitated. Right now, there is massive amounts of people that need help and are agitated. Number two, 
Social distancing has changed the way we're bringing people together for both advocacy and mutual aid. So the traditional structures are no longer absorbing the energy or the or meeting the needs of those things because social distancing is changing all the tactics and changing all the ways in which people connect to the normal means of getting their needs met. Okay. Three, the massive amount of people want to help and be mobilized, but because of social distancing, it's very challenging. And also, they're, they, these are people outside of structures that I said. They're, these are people that need to be mobilized outside of structures, and those structures do not exist. Okay, And the crisis is creating a problem for every issue in every constituency. So a lot of the people that are mobilized and agitated outside, they're agitated about frontline workers, or they're agitated about the economy collapsing. But they're not agitated about a single issue. They're agitated about specifically about the effects of the pandemic. And we don't have a movement culture that can absorb all those people. We, we're still developing that. That's emerging. Lots of different organizations are trying to do that in lots of different ways. Okay, And that crisis is happening also with problems. The spotlight is on the pandemic, so it's very hard because we can't just talk about our issues in the same way anymore during this moment because it, the spotlight isn't on our issue. It is if we can talk about it and relate it to the pandemic because people are interested in the pandemic. They're not just interested in our issue as much because the spotlight and everyone is really being affected by the pandemic. Okay, And what does that mean? Different organizations have to think about that in different ways. Unions are thinking about that and, and how does it affect their workers. We have uh, you know, the, the nurses are thinking about that and how that affects the nurses. We're thinking uh, the criminal justice movement is doing this huge campaign to get people released from jail because coronavirus is spreading and it's incredibly effective. They've been able to get hundreds of thousands of people out of jail by making that pivot to the crisis. OK. So first, I want to just say there is massive amounts of people out there that want to help and be mobilized, but there isn't a good structure. OK, I'll give you an example of this. In the UK, they made a call out. The government made a call and said, we're going to create this, this, this core of people that are going to help the National Health Service. They're going to help frontline workers. And we want people, we're going to create like a, a volunteer core. If you could drop out and work full time with us as a volunteer, we're making a call out. Come join, join us. Okay? And they said, wow, you know, maybe this is a big ask of people. Maybe... There, there's a lot of people unemployed, maybe 100,000, maybe 200,000 people would apply to join the Volunteer Corps. Okay? 750,000 people signed up in six days. They got so many applications, they couldn't even take all the applications. The, the website wasn't even working very well because there were so many people that wanted to get involved. And they wanted to give their lives and risk so much <laughs> to help because they were agitated about this issue. Those people are out there. But what this shows is that they're out there, and if there's ways in which we can mobilize them, they will come out of the woodwork. Okay. Um, Sunrise. Uh, this is a movement that uh, I'm very close with. In the Momentum community, the training institute that I helped found, um, we helped incubate Sunrise, and they did trainings. Okay, they, they're doing trainings around uh, crash courses and how coronavirus and Green New Deal. And a lot of times, you know, they'll get 50 people, 100 people, maybe even 200 people. They had thousands of people sign up for their training, okay, because they were really interested and they wanted to see how the Green New Deal and coronavirus would be connected. We've done the same thing. We had, we were doing a webinar, and we'll tell you because we recorded them what these webinars are about how to respond in this trigger event. And normally we have about, you know, maybe 20, 30 people sign up, sign up, and 400 people signed up to our training. I mean, we don't even have a big list to advertise to. It just went out and lots and lots of people, you know, we didn't even have a Zoom account that could take that many people, you know. So it's like people are out there, people are interested. And this this training that Sunrise did, this was this was a this is like a big this was a four day training. I mean, this is a big ask of people, you know. So fourth, the crisis is creating problems for every issue in every constituency everyone has to reorient to 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 be part of the spotlight and to to be able to understand to if you want to be able to figure out how this catastrophe relates to us and where we have opportunities to make change right now we have to understand we have to pivot our issues and think about how to 
fight for our constituency and our issues specifically in this in this moment. And we see this, that labor unions have done a lot of really good work in figuring out how to fight for uh, uh, unemployment insurance and uh, better unemployment laws. Um, and we see uh, the People's Bailout, which is a coalition of organizations that are trying to, to propose all these new policies for for everyone in America and in labor unions. The labor unions are really leading that. The criminal justice movement has done an incredible job pivoting and figuring out this is a great opportunity to talk about not how we hold people in jail, uh, and way too many people, and how they're the most vulnerable population, and how we have to release them. And they've been incredibly uh, effective. So those are the five musts. Uh, no, those are the, the four ways in which the trigger event uh, is the four factors affecting the movement ecologies right now. This is what the trigger event is really doing. We have to orient them to think strategically, okay? And each piece of the movement ecology needs to think about how to orient that way, okay? And in, the, in, in movements where they are doing good stuff is they're doing that. So these are the five musts that we say. We must support each other. It's time for the big ass. Maximize and leverage popular issues. It's time for shared infrastructure in our movements that will cre are created in crisis. And we have to contribute to creating a common identity. Okay? So I'm just going to go through these real fast so we have more time for questions. Okay? So uh, as we said, we need to support each other. We need This is the time to really think creatively about, about doing movement ecology. We, mutual aid needs advocacy, advocacy needs mutual aid. A lot of times they will be separate and they'll fight against each other. Some of the best examples, like the AIDS crisis in the 80s, another pandemic in the United States, mutual aid that was created for the, uh, the gay community, uh, primarily the gay community, it also happened in the Haitian and hemophiliac communities, uh, because the government wasn't good at responding, became the base for advocacy. And that, I think that can happen in this pandemic, but it only happens if mutual aid understands that they need to do both mutual aid and educate people and mobilize people for advocacy. And the same thing with advocacy. Advocacy needs to understand how to support mutual aid, okay? It's time for the big ass. You know, Dorothy Day, when she started the Catholic Worker Movement, she wanted people to drop out, live together, live with the poor, and make, uh, you know, $5 a month. And they're like, no one's going to do that. She says, that, that's what Jesus has. Jesus in the Bible says, leave all that you have and come and follow me. Guess what? Hundreds of, hundreds of people did it. If you ask, a lot of people will show up. And right now we see that. that the example of the UK, like people dropping out. We see volunteer corps. We see if you have a big ask right now of people, a lot of times they will step up because they feel the urgency right now. We have to think about popular demands that are bigger than our small demands. Small demands for our issue is really important. We have to reorient around them, but we have to think about how, how collectively we have to think about a new vision of how to respond to the coronavirus. Um, it's, right now is a time for us to think about pooling some of our infrastructure so that we can think about how do we create a common infrastructure that can actually absorb people that is beyond what we know we can do. Right now, we're... None of our organizations are enough. We need to create a meta infrastructure that can start mobilizing. And that's starting to emerge, like the people's bailout. That's starting to emerge. There's campaigns that are doing that. But it's not going to happen unless we orient to sharing our resources with each other with the vision of building a common movement towards uh, this, towards trying to mitigate the harm and the devastation of this pandemic. Okay? And we need to create a common identity. These movements around the pandemic, we need a, a common uh, anti-pandemic movement or something like that. Uh, and that's what happened in the AIDS, AIDS crisis. There was uh, ACT UP created a common identity of people fighting against the pandemic. The dreamers, you know, there was all these undocumented immigrants. When they created a collective identity about being a dreamer, it changed everything. It created a common movement. That's emerging right now, but it's we haven't really created it. And it went... One of the things is you got to pay attention to it because it might actually happen. Everyone has a role here. Everyone has a role. Okay? We can all do minimal amounts of things. We call these primary sacrifices. That creates a sense of, of, of uh, unity in the movement. We can all be involved in just a little bit of mutual aid. That doesn't mean that's the core thing you do, but we can all be involved just a little bit, and that allows us to build the relationships and have a consciousness of different pieces of the ecology. Uh, th this is what I'm talking about right now within this trigger event. 
And we can all, in your movement, your organization, in your movement needs to go through an organizational reorientation. You need to reorient around this trigger event. There's no way around it. You can't sit this one out. Um, that's my opinion. Um, and uh, this is our advice about how to do that. Okay, so let's take a breath in, breath out. Breath in, breath out. Okay, questions? All right, we've got time for one or two. Um, Esther asks, uh, if you could explain more about what happens to a movement ecology when there's too much focus on one one or another theory of change or like kind of patterns that you see around too much focus in one of those slices of the pie? Most of the time, it's not a problem, okay? Because most of the time, um, when you're in a trigger event, you can't control the spotlight. The spotlight goes where it goes, you know? And the trigger event creates a spotlight on the crisis we're all feeling. So if you're a journalist right now and you wanna write something, anything other than the pandemic, it's very hard to get an article published, okay? That's a, that's a fact, that's just a fact. You can't control that, okay? It might have a negative impact on your movement, but that's the reality. But during normal times, the spotlight is so is not so focused so you generally in a movement ecology if anybody's getting any spotlight it's generally good for the whole ecology generally okay um so you don't really have to worry about people hogging the spotlight okay there there is problems about who takes credit but that's a whole nother category generally if anybody gets attention around your issue in the spotlight of the issue it helps the whole movement ecology okay Okay, um, so this could be a challenging one, but it's gonna would be really helpful for us to hear from you. Um, coming kind of more of an outsider to the animal movement specifically, uh, the an animals have often kind of been perceived as, or like we often perceive ourselves as a bit of an orphan issue on the left, yes. like not well accepted within uh, the broader left. What yeah. do you think, like, what have you seen that the animal movement could do differently to sort of increase the ability of, of other social justice movements to accept animal rights as, as kind of a legitimate left cause? That's a very good question. I think that there's a few different things. Number one, the, the purity culture around alternatives and personal transformation, like being a vegan, I'm a vegetarian myself. And when I first became a vegetarian, I was a militant vegetarian, you know, like I was like shaming the, sh the crap out of all my friends. You're eating me. Why the hell are you eating me? Okay. But I, I wasn't even disciplined enough to be a vegan. I mean, there were no one around me was being a vegan, you know, but like it just, I had that really, and that wasn't a strategy that worked at actually building coalition with other people, you know? And so the first thing is that we, we have to let go of some of the we, we can accept that being vegan is good and create communities where where you know where we can hold some of those some of those norms, but we also need to learn how to communicate with just people on the street. We have to learn how to talk about our issues in a way that is really torn towards the public. And we have to say both and. Okay, we're used to talking about our issue in this siloed way, but people aren't just carrying a, just care about their pets, right? That's like one way to talk about it is to get people involved. But they also, if, if you can, if, if they can, they're less defensive if you can talk about how animal rights doesn't conflict with workers' rights, doesn't conflict uh, with, um, with other interests, okay? Because a lot of times people are defensive about animal rights because they, they, they feel it attacks them or it, and, and it hurts the workers or it hurts the economy or whatever. And if you can have a vision that says, come on, we can work together, it actually, reforming industrial agriculture helps everybody. It helps workers and whatever. I think one of the greatest people to study on this uh, is, uh, and also an animal rights activist, is uh, Judy Berry. I don't know if you ever heard of Judy Berry, but we write about her in our, in our book. Um, she was a huge uh, environmental activist to protect the redwoods in Northern California, and she was a labor organizer. And uh, before she became an environmental activist,
psychologist and she believed in deep ecology. She was very into deep ecology and she created coalitions with the loggers, you know, because she, she was like, no, we're not, uh, we can save the redwoods and actually create a sustainable industry that will actually be better for the workers and that we're not against the loggers. We're actually against the corporations. And, and that really changed um, everything for that issue locally and nationally. Awesome. And sort of segueing from that, um, as a last question, for folks on the call who, you know, want to learn more about everything you presented today, want to get deeper into these questions, want to get to the point of world dominating strategy, what are some resources they could, what, you know, where could we go? Yes. I want to say I'm into collective domination, not, not individuals that we all, we all control. The, the society and even even are able to, to to incorporate the voices of all sentient beings in in our our sense of democracy now I, I don't know if you guys know this but I there's this thinker uh, a Bolivian thinker that uh, talks about the expansion of rights uh, into the natural domain uh, his name is Pablo Saban he was the UN uh, ambassador under Evo Morales and he writes an incredible piece about this concept of the, how to incorporate democracy to include rights of the natural world. I really think it's it's one of the – and they actually incorporated it into the Bolivian um, constitution. Um, so anyways, uh, so that's my concept of world domination. <laughs> but I, I was just using it as a joke. Uh, but anyways, so INE Institute is the, is the training institute that I work for. These are two that we've taught – that we have um, been – we produced two webinars. We have another webinar that's about uh, strategy for the whole movement ecology in the corona uh, and during the pandemic, around the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, you can get resources on that. Momentum is a training institute that I helped co-found. I don't run that anymore. I'm, I, I'm, only, I'm just an advisor on occasion, uh, but I, very, I support Momentum trainings. I think they're great. They're really talking about how to do mass protest movements, um, how to build mass protest movements and and they do social movement ecology a little bit too. But uh, so you can look at INE Institute and Momentum for more information on this. Also, uh, I'll plug my book. Uh, it's called This Is Uprising. This is my book. Ooh, Paul's book. Okay, you can buy that uh, if you want to. It's on uh, whatever format you want to use to buy books. I don't want to mention the evil overlords of Amazon, but you can't buy it on Amazon. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Paul. This has been an absolute treat. Honestly, might have been the most, one of the, easily the most engaging talk I've seen in, in, a, in a few years, if not longer. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I can't even, don't, don't have enough words for it. Uh, well, May all sentient beings be included into our democracy. May all sentient beings have some form of rights and their voice be heard so that we can end suffering for us all. Amen. Thanks, Paul.